can you see the speaker shaking? It's shaking the air in front of it. I can feel it with my hand. It shakes the hairs on my hand. It shakes the air all the way up here to my head. It shakes the, the uh, air by my ears. And then I can hear it. And you can hear it too. Somehow we capture this vibration of the air and send it over and your speakers shake the air in your room and, and you can hear this throbbing bass as well. My name is Josh Batson and I'm a graduate student at MIT. And I'm Yoni Khan and I'm also a graduate student at MIT. Today we're going to talk to you a little bit about the physics of sound production and the shape of sound. All sound really is is vibrations of air molecules. It's just the air in this room moving back and forth very fast, very small distances. But somehow you hear that as sound. How does that happen? Well, inside your ear, there are little bones and hairs which vibrate along with the air in the room, producing electrical signals which get fed to your brain and interpreted by you as sound. And in fact, the only reason you can hear anything that we're saying on this video is thanks to some electronic devices which do exactly that. These are microphones. And at their core, they just have two metal plates a very small distance apart which vibrate along with the air just as the structures in your ear do. And they also produce varying electrical signals, which get fed to your computer, put out through your speakers, and then heard again by you as sound. So to investigate the physics of sound production a little further, we're actually going to use our own musical instruments, since we're both musicians. We're going to go on stage at Kresge Auditorium and make our own sound. Here we are on stage at MIT's Kresge Auditorium, uh, which, in addition to being a gorgeous performance space, also has fantastic acoustics. And it has this wonderful, uh, though ancient MacBook Pro with free software on it called Audacity. You can get it anywhere online. And what it will do is record, using its the computer's microphones, any sounds or music or noise in the room. Here you can see me talking. And here you can see me shouting. And as you can see, it's a bit bigger when I'm shouting. Uh, but we also have this wonderful French horn here, so why don't we see how some music looks on Audacity? <laughs> contained in what's on the screen, but right now all it seems to be telling us is how loud I was playing. And there were a lot of notes in there, and it might be interesting to see if we can tell what note I was playing just by looking at it. And we know that the note's in there somehow because when we clicked play and it went through here and put the vibrations back out on its own speakers, we could hear the note, so it's sitting in there somewhere. Good. So let's isolate the first two notes of the piece I just played. All right. Sure. Okay. Nine, ten, 
11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and a little bit, 16 and a little bit peaks in 0.05 seconds. So let's just call it 16 to make the math easier. Okay. So that's 320 times a second. Thanks for doing the math. 320 yeah. times a second, the air is going really big and small again, moving back and forth. And somehow our ear interprets that as a single note, and it's pretty short actually. Let's remember how short that note was. So it started from here and to here. And that's it. Bob. So in musical terms, what I just played was an E flat. But in mathematical terms, something was vibrating at 320 times a second. We would say that it has a frequency of 320 hertz. Okay, and I just scroll this back to the original note, the first note, the low one, and we can pick our window, say from 0.53 up to 0.58. This is also 0.05 seconds, and we can count one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's interesting. It's almost exactly half as frequent as the note that we just looked at. So that makes sense because the notes that I played, let me remind you of what they were, are an octave apart. And that's all an octave means in mathematical terms. It's two notes whose frequencies differ by half. Okay, so if this. These frequencies, how quickly these things are vibrating, are related to the pitch. Well, then we should just be able to test this. Let me let me delete what we've got so far, and I'm just going to sing a little something. You'll really like this. Uh... Okay, that's my beautiful rendition. And here we are where it quit. I was singing really high, pretty much higher than I should, and we see it. That choppy, that frequent, and if we go back in time, so it looks like they're getting farther and farther apart. And if we roll it, roll it back, back, and look how far apart they are at the beginning. So let's just watch this forward in time. Uh, uh, okay, that's enough. So it certainly looks like the shapes although they're changing, are getting closer and closer together as the pitch goes up. So I'd say that's a, it's a win for the scientific method. We had a hypothesis about um, the frequency of the shape determining the pitch that we hear, and it certainly looks like that's the case. But the one thing that we haven't looked at yet is the shape. Um, so now we're going to try a little experiment to see if we can change the shape of these repeating patterns. Well, maybe I'll just try singing, but with different sounds. I mean, just use the different vowels. Ah, e, u, uh, mm. And we can roll this back to the head and watch those different sounds and how they're shaped. Ah, e, u, uh, mm. So it looks like they're spaced about the same interval apart, which makes sense because he was singing the same note. But the shapes are totally different. They're completely different. But, well, if the shapes are different for my different sounds, they must be more different for, well, maybe instruments playing pitches? Well, luckily, Josh has a trumpet here that he'd be happy to pull out and demonstrate for you. So, uh, <laughs> Josh is going to play the same note uh, that I just ended on, and then I'll play it on the horn, and we'll see how different the shapes are. What was that? That was a concert clap? Mm -hmm. Real spike. And we can play through. Okay, so it certainly looks like the horn Look waveform is, is a lot smoother. A lot smoother. And it sounds a lot smoother too. Much mellower sound. Yeah, so we can really tell the difference uh, from one instrument to the next just by looking at the waveform. What's interesting is that I can actually change the shape of the waveform that my instrument makes by moving my hand around in the bell. So the French horn is usually played with the hand approximately here, about halfway in the bell. So I'm going to play the same note three times, once with my hand all the way out, once about halfway in, and once covering the bell entirely. And let's just hear how the sound changes and also see how the shape of the waveform changes.
Wow. So there was almost no difference between the first two, but as soon as I covered the bell up, it goes crazy. You get all of these much faster variations on top of the original tone. You know, and it looks a lot more like the, the waveform of the trumpet. And it sounded more like the trumpet there. It sounded more when you, when you had your, your hand all the way and it had a more brassy sound. Yeah, so now we can really say what this musical term brassy means. It has to do with the shape of the waveform. That a spikier waveform means it's going to have a brassier sound. So we've discovered that brassiness, which is a musical quality, can be related back to the shape of the waveform. Really, all the information about the sound is what's being displayed in the computer screen right now. So since we've talked a lot about brass instruments in this video, we thought it would be nice to end with both of us playing a duet on our brass instruments.